From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We're going to start out, as we always do, with a check on the markets. Abigail Doolittle is here, and Abigail, steal from your note here. We're stuck in sideways. We are indeed. <laughs> very small moves on the surface here, David, for the S&P 500, the Dow, and even at this point, the Nasdaq. Very small gains, about two-tenths of one percent to the upside. The bigger range, of course, is over the last four months. Bulls trying to break out of it, but we're still stuck in that range as well. Where we have more action, though, beneath the surface, we have the Russell 2000 really outperforming that small cap index up about seven tenths of one percent. So that cyclical value rotation continuing. It's also showing uh, in the KBW Bank Index up even more, up about one point four percent. So investors wanting in again on that move toward reopening the reflation trade where they're moving out of the big tech names such as Microsoft and Amazon, that stay at home trade. Interesting, though, is David, while we do have stocks basically stuck in this side, sideways range. It seems the bulls want to break out. Optimism forward six to nine months around the vaccine. On the other hand, bonds, we have this quiet rally in bonds over the last few days. The 10-year yield firmly in this year's range. So it continues to seem that bonds are pricing uh, for the possibility of the near-term challenges around the virus spread while stocks are looking ahead. It's not clear what side is right. Stay tuned. There could be some interesting action and volatility ahead, David. We will stay tuned with you. Thank you so much to Abigail Dulo for that report on the markets. Fast congressional action helped bring the U.S. economy back after the shutdown triggered by the pandemic. Welcome now one of those at the very center of the debate over future economic stimulus, if there is any, Republican Congressman Patrick McHenry of North Carolina. He is ranking member of the House Finance Committee. So, Congressman, always a delight to have you with us. As I say, I think most people agree Congress really acted big and fast to, and it would help bring the economy back. But now we're seeing some wobbliness, particularly as coronavirus seems to come back. Do we need some more stimulus to avoid a double dip in the in the economy? Yeah, I think we do. And I think the Federal Reserve agrees. Uh, we have a tale of two recoveries. We have part of uh, our country and segments of our economy doing quite well, roaring, in fact. And you have other segments, uh, like the restaurant industry, for instance, uh, that are just uh, that, that are just going to struggle for the coming months, uh, given the nature of the virus. Um, and, and they're the ones that need a, a little assistance to get through the darkest moments of winter. Uh, and, and I think that's why we need to actually have a targeted package here with targeted relief and additional flexibility for state and locals, local governments, uh, to get through this thing. So I think an important word in what you just said was little, <laughs> because we have on the one right. hand uh, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. I think he's at five hundred billion dollars. We have, as I understand it, President-elect uh, Biden saying it's got to be two point two trillion more in the Nancy Pelosi camp, if I can say it that way. Is there a possibility of a compromise on that? We had Jamie Dimon, the head of J.P. Morgan, just today saying it's childish to use his word for Congress not to compromise on this. Well, yes, but. Also, what I, uh, what I would say here is that uh, the president and uh, the secretary of the Treasury were quite flexible in attempting to negotiate with Nancy Pelosi, but she was playing politics in July, August, September, October. It's presidential election year. Uh, the reins of power were, were at play here, and uh, Speaker Pelosi played her political hand. Now she has fewer Democrats in the House. You still have a Republican Senate, and, but Biden got elected. So part of her play was was effective for her political outcome. Now that the election's over, I think we can come to a deal, and I think we can readily come to a deal on a smaller package, not something like uh, Pelosi put together, which was the $2 trillion grab bag of every liberal idea that they've had for the last half a decade that they throw into a bill. Uh, it's a bunch of garbage. Most of that bill has nothing to do with the virus. Um, it, it has other extraneous uh, political issues about corporate governance, for instance. It has nothing to do with the virus. So let's pare it down. Let's get rational about this thing. And uh, let's get to the table and negotiate. Uh, could we get it done in this Congress, that is to say, before the end of the year as a practical matter? And, and do we need to? Because we do see coronavirus coming back across the country in a lot of different places. And some governments now having some partial shutdowns. Right. And, and that's why we need to have a modest package to get us through the next two, three months. Um, I don't think we need something the size of the CARES Act. And I think Mitch McConnell's right in terms of the size. And I think the Federal Reserve would concur, would concur uh, that an additional boost is, is necessary. So all those things, uh, I think, uh, uh, tell me, and the fact that we're post, uh, post-election uh, and, and coming into a divided government uh, for the, uh, uh, that, that 
we could come to terms in the month of December and get a small deal done. If you're going to hold out for $2 trillion, that's going to take till probably February to get a package of that size done, if at all it could happen even then. The reports are that the president of the United States, Donald Trump, has decided he's not participating anymore, that he's going to leave it up to Congress to sort this thing out, that he's not really going to be in the negotiations. Is the president helping at this point? And let me be very pointed about it. Is he helping by not conceding the election? Because most people seem to agree at this point that it is President-elect Biden. What is the advantage for the country? What is the advantage for the country and the president not recognizing it's time to move on? Well, uh each state certifies the election at different dates. Um, and so uh, over uh, the next couple of days, over the next week period of time, you'll have each state certify their presidential election and, and actually their full election returns. Uh, when that's done, I think the election's done. Uh, and that's when I would get my certificate for re-election, for instance, uh, and the House would receive that. Um, and so uh, let's see, let's get those uh, those certificates done. And I think that's when it's done. For the presidential election, you then have presidential electors that meet and formally do this. But uh, it, you know, for the last um, 150 years, that's just been a formality, roughly. Um, and so uh, I think once we have the election certificates, I think uh, things are said and done, and that's when you have to accept the results. Do you expect that the president will accept them at that point with the certification? I mean, that is the key date, as you say. Uh, and if he doesn't, will Republicans such as yourself actually call upon him to do that? Well, I, I think I've just said that uh, that's <laughs> what I think we, we should do. Uh, and and so um, I've not been one to critique the president on on this action or that action or whatever else. It's just not my, um, not my role to be a— um, uh, political talking head and, and a quote unquote political strategist. I'm a policymaker. Um, but I think, in terms of the practical impact under our system of laws and our constitutional system, once you have that certificate of election and once those uh, uh, delegates are, uh, those electors are, are, are certified as well and vote, then it's done. Then you have to accept it under our uh, legal and constitutional regime. And I think you will. Congressman, I never want to talk with you about talking about the deficit because it's something I know that is very important to you. It looks like we're going to have a divided Congress in all likelihood, depending on what happens in Georgia, but I think it's what is the most likely result. Is that going to be good for the deficit in the sense of really getting control of it? Well, um, it, hard to tell in this environment. I mean, we've, we've got some really tough days ahead for the American people, given the nature of this virus. Um, and we want to get through that. Then we need to get uh, back to the back to a focused effort to pare down um, our debt and deficit in a rational way over the next generation. Um, and I do think um, I, I am hopeful that a divided government can force that compromise, that that bipartisan compromise necessary to put our government funding on a sustainable path. Uh, we have a ready uh, taxation regime. We had a roaring economy even back as in February, the best economy of, uh, of my lifetime. Um, and so we need to get back to a strong economy and start paring down the spending of our federal government. And I, I'm hopeful that in an invited government we can do that. Uh, how do you envision this vaccine news? I mean, it's certainly good news. Everyone agrees to that. Do we need a bridge, an economic bridge to get us there? I think so. And I think we have to have a firm uh, understanding of the delivery methods for this vaccine and the prioritization. I think that's a, a very key thing for, for policymakers and for the general public to understand how this pack vaccine will be distributed, these vaccines will be distributed, how they'll be prioritized, and start seeing the time frame. I'm very interested in, in uh, ensuring that uh, we have that, uh, that continuity of delivery system. Uh, but in the meantime, our economy will struggle just based off the nature of this virus and what we have to do to limit the spread, uh, the control that we have as individuals to limit the, the spread, uh, like wearing masks and social distancing and avoiding large public gatherings. Those things are all rational, but that also has a severe impact on our economy. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to go back to full lockdowns like we did uh, back in March, but I, I do think we're going to be uh, uh, we're going to have a more constrained economy because us as uh, we, the average American people, right. are going to have a constrained interaction with other people. 
All right, Congressman, great to have you with us. As always, that's Congressman Patrick McHenry. He's ranking member of the House Financial Services Committee, and I'm happy to say we're going to have more with him coming up in the 1 p.m. hour on Bloomberg Radio. Coming up here, Dr. Stephen Corwin, head of the New York Presbyterian Hospital Center, will bring us his take on where we are on the current coronavirus crisis. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We turn now to Mark Crumpton for Bloomberg First Word News. David, thank you. President Trump's campaign has wired the Wisconsin Elections Commission $3 million ahead of a deadline for an official request for a recount in a key swing state that helped give President-elect Joe Biden a victory. The campaign is claiming absentee ballots were illegally issued and altered. Any recount would need to be completed by December 1st, when the commission must certify the election results. House Democrats have voted to stick with Nancy Pelosi as their leader and nominee for speaker. She must still win a majority of votes from the full House to remain as speaker when the new Congress begins in January. She will have a slimmer majority next year, which complicates her path to securing enough support to win the gavel on the first round of voting. Some pandemic aid programs are set to expire in the new year, leaving millions without the government support that's helped keep them afloat. The biggest blow will likely come from the end of two federal unemployment insurance programs, with roughly 12 million people facing a late December cutoff. That's according to a study released today by the Century Foundation. Also, measures that froze student loan payments, offered mortgage forbearance, and halted evictions have a year-end deadline. A top European Union official says trade talks with the United Kingdom still face, quoting here, substantial work that might spill over into next week. The comments dampened hopes that a deal could be approved when the EU leaders meet in a video conference on Thursday. The UK left the EU on January 31st, but a transition period runs until the end of next month. Both sides had hoped to get a trade deal by then. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks very much, Mark. The last spring, we suffered from a massive surge in coronavirus cases, much of it centered in the Northeast, with New York right in the epicenter. Now we're seeing a new surge. To get some perspective on what we are seeing now, we welcome back to Bloomberg Dr. Stephen Corwin. He is president and CEO of New York Presbyterian Hospital, one of the largest in the world, ranked number one in the New York metropolitan area and number four nationwide. So, doctor, thank you so much for being back with us. Give us your perspective now. How does this compare with that world when we saw last March. How is it similar? How is it different? Well, last March and April, you saw really it concentrated in the Northeast and it was more sporadic. Now you're seeing this across the entire country, uh, which is worrisome in terms of how stretched we're going to be, particularly on issues like staffing. Recall that when New York went through this crisis, we received help from around the country, uh, staffing help from around the country. That's not going to be uh, available for many of the health systems now because we're seeing it across the entire country. Testing and testing reagents are going to be stretched uh, as well. Uh, so I think that it's, it's, it's somewhat different. Now, having said that, the demography is, is more favorable. Younger people tend to do better than older people. Uh, the mortality is less. The number of people requiring ventilators uh, throughout the country is less than when we first saw it and, and, uh, in both the March and April time frame uh, and in the July-August time frame in the, in the Southwest. So those are uh, somewhat comforting. I do think that uh, despite all the rhetoric around mask wearing and so on, the people paying attention to mask wearing, social distancing uh, has helped. So I think we're in somewhat better shape, but there are different challenges this go around. What kind of surges are you seeing in your hospital center uh, as a practical matter for uh, hospitalizations? So at the, at the nadir, we were at about 2% of our peak. Uh, now we're at about 10 to 15% of our peak, uh, and we expect it to go up to about 25% of the peak, depending on exactly what happens over the Thanksgiving holiday and then, of course, uh, Christmas time. So... We are preparing for it. Uh, we do have adequate ventilators. We do have adequate masks, PPE, et cetera. 
We do worry about uh, the uh, number of reagents that we will have uh, for adequate testing. Uh, but I feel that we're in better shape than March and April, and we're hopeful that it will be uh, less strenuous than March and April for sure. And look, we have the, uh, the, the likelihood of uh, the vaccines uh, not only being approved, but uh, starting to be distributed at the end of December and January, and then hopefully ramping up by the uh, April-May time frame. So you can see the goal line in sight if we can just get through the next few months. Well, okay, to follow that analogy, you see the goal line. The question is, how do we not fumble the ball in the meantime? Because there's some people who feel tired about wearing those masks you said help and social distancing. How long do we have to keep that up in your estimation before we really have effective protection from the vaccine? A few months. I think you're looking at the rest of November, December, January into February. Hopefully, but in the February, March time frame, you're starting to see widespread availability of the vaccine. And, and David, if I could put a plug in, we must insist on mass vaccination. The pain that we've gone through as a country, the deaths that we've had, the effect on so many different industries and businesses, we've got to insist on mass vaccination. We've got to make sure that we educate our population about it. I tell you, I would be the first in line for either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. Uh, I think it's been a remarkable accomplishment. And with all of the negatives about how the administration has handled this, uh, I think that Operation Warp Speed was a success and the private sector really stepped up here uh, in a major way. This is the shortest time to get a vaccine uh, in, the, in the history of vaccines. It, it is really a remarkable scientific accomplishment. So, so, Doctor, the question now is how the baton will be passed from the Trump administration to what really everybody agrees is going to be the Biden administration. What would you hope to see from a Biden administration that might be different from what you've seen from a Trump administration? Well, the first thing is I think this transition is critical. Uh, the initial distribution of the vaccine is, let's say, going to be uh, uh, 20 million doses or 30 million doses. Uh, if you require two doses per vaccine, you're only talking about 15 million Americans getting it. So the coordination between the outgoing administration and the Biden administration becomes critical so that everybody's on the same page. How is it going to get distributed? What is the IT system associated with this? What are the state allocations? Do the states have plans that make sense? How do you prioritize this? How do you make it equitable? Uh, that should be being discussed right now. Uh, and I know that you, you spoke to the congressman before. Yes, uh, the election needs to be certified, but we there is a clear winner here. And at the very least, there should be widespread support for sharing of information and allowing for an effective tr transition to happen. If it turns out that the president uh, actually won, which no one thinks is likely, okay, then there's no harm, no foul. But not doing this uh, handoff, I think, is, is really critical. As you said, uh, you don't want to fumble it uh, when you're inside of the goal line, and we need an effective passing of the baton. So, Doctor, let's let's pursue that for a moment, because we've heard from President-elect Biden that, in fact, lives could be at stake because there's not having we're not having that transition right now. It's being held up. Is that too dramatic? You know, I think that um, it, 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 it's a little bit dramatic, but he's making the point that um, the quicker that we can come together on this in terms of the vaccine distribution and a common uh, agreement on the playbook, I think the better off we're going to be. Uh, let's stop arguing about the masks already. It, we're beyond that. Uh, even the governor of North Dakota said we have to wear masks. Let's assure the people that President Trump and President-elect Biden are working together to make sure that this next few months is um, as, as painless as it can be in a painful situation. I think that's what he meant. Uh, you know, I think that the Thanksgiving holiday, I'm sure you yourself, uh, you know, my family is, is not particularly happy with the fact that everyone's going to be socially distancing. But let's, let's think about what Thanksgiving really means. You thank uh, God for our country, for your family, for your health. So let's not give each other uh, COVID over the Thanksgiving and Christmas holidays. 
Yeah, absolutely. Right. I, I'm just speaking for myself. It'll be my wife and me and our two kids, and that's going to be it. That's that's you all got we that. have. That's your pod. Exactly right. That's it. Exactly. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. That's Dr. Stephen Corwin. He's New York Presbyterian president and CEO. And a quick note now, be sure to check out the latest highlights from the Bloomberg New Economy Forum using the function NEF Go on your terminal. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Boeing has been cleared to fly its 737 MAX again, but questions remain about how much demand COVID has left in the skies. Kaylee Lines is here for a report. Well, David, this has been a long time coming, and finally the FAA has cleared the 737 MAX to fly once again after it has been grounded for 20 months, since all the way back in March of 2019. That is the longest grounding for any jet on record, and we've seen Boeing stock plunge by about half since the grounding as a result. Now, overall, the grounding has cost the company about $20 billion and also taken more than 1,000 MAX jets off the order backlog. Boeing does expect to deliver about half of the 400. 50 MAX jets that are in storage at the moment by uh, the course of the next year. And our analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence think that'll free up uh, a drive around $6 billion in cash, set them up for a return to positive cash generation. Um, I should note here, David, that there's been a lot of optimism that this was going to happen and that Boeing stock over the course of November was already up 50% going into today, which may be why the shares are flat or even a little bit lower in today's session. But we also have to consider that this doesn't just make all of Boeing's problems go away. The clearance of this jet does have some caveats, a wide swath of fixes, including repairs to the system that caused the two crashes of the jet that killed 346 people. They're also requiring new training for pilots. And because of that new training, it does mean that this jet may not actually be flown by the major airlines for some time now, American has said uh, that it does intend to fly its first flight starting on the schedule on December 29th, but United doesn't expect to do it till the first quarter. Southwest, not until at least the second quarter of 2021. And there does remain that question, David, as to how many jets they're actually going to need, given that the pandemic has totally sapped demand for air travel. Boeing has only delivered 97 planes so far this year. They only delivered 380 over the course of 2019. Of course, the 737 MAX ground a big part of that. Now, obviously, that grounding at this point, David, is now over. But are people going to want to buy 737 Maxes going forward, David? Exactly. It's been a while since most of us have been on a commercial airliner. I think it's fair to say thank you so much to Kaylee Lines for the report on Boeing. Up next, Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota on the coronavirus, which has hit his home state particularly hard, and on the transition to a Biden administration and some of the decisions being made by the Trump administration on the way out the door. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. A federal judge has ordered the Trump administration to stop expelling immigrant, immigrant children who cross the southern border alone. That halts a policy that has resulted in thousands of rapid deportations of minors during the coronavirus pandemic. The Trump administration has expelled more than 147,000 people since March, including at least 8,800 unaccompanied children. The Justice Department hasn't said whether it will appeal as it has other similar rulings. Twitter will no longer give President Trump special treatment since he's out of office. CEO Jack Dorsey told the Senate Judiciary Committee the social media platform will treat Mr. Trump like any other user after Joe Biden is sworn in. That means he will be barred from making threats, harassing other users, or violating copyright. Twitter has either flagged the president's tweets with a warning or disabled a video, but not suspended his account. In Germany, police fired water cannon at demonstrators protesting coronavirus restrictions after crowds ignored calls to wear masks and socially distance. Some demonstrators threw fireworks and flares in response outside the landmark Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. German lawmakers are expected to pass new laws enforcing mask wearing and other measures to slow the spread of COVID-19. Thailand will extend a nationwide state of emergency through January 15th. 
to prevent a resurgence in coronavirus infections during the peak New Year's travel period. It would be the eighth extension since the initial order in March. While Thailand has been largely free of community transmission of the virus, its economy has been savaged by the hit from the pandemic to its exports and tourism sectors. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Last spring, the coronavirus seemed centered on major metropolitan areas, but the current surge is hitting less densely populated areas as well. We welcome now Republican Senator Mike Rounds from one of the states being particularly hard hit, and that is South Dakota. So, Senator, welcome. Good to have you here. First of all, our concerns for South Dakota. Give us your sense of where things stand right now in your home state. We're like the rest of the nation. Uh, we're being hit by COVID-19. Most certainly, we're asking and continuing to suggest to everybody that lives in our state to use the common sense the good Lord gave them. Uh, wear a mask. Uh, don't be afraid to wear a mask if you're inside. Uh, we've got folks that work outside in South Dakota. If you're outside and you're working, you know, mask isn't necessary. But if you're inside, we most certainly want you to wear one. We've got significant issues, just like every other state does, and we want to do everything we can to bend the curve again. Uh, we bent the curve before. We can do it again. We most certainly uh, encourage all of our people to use, you know, social distancing whenever possible. But we've lost 644 uh, members of our community in South Dakota. We're not a big state. We've got less than 900,000 people in the entire state. And most of us know people that, that, you know, we've lost people that we know. A lot of us have loved ones that we've lost. And so it hits us just like it does every other state. Senator, I went online today, and looking at your dashboard for North South Dakota, it looked like there's a disproportionate effect on Native Americans, of whom, whom you have quite a few in South Dakota. Is that the case, and if so, is there something special that can or should be done for that particular part of the community? Our Native American community is served by Indian Health Service, if you want to call it being served. Uh, Native American leadership, our chairman, have been working very hard. In many cases, they've restricted travel in and out of our reservations, doing their best to try to stop the spread of the COVID-19 virus. But let's be honest, a, a number of our Native Americans, uh, they, they don't have the best health care available. Not like the rest of America, they have IHS. Look, we have some of the highest rate, rates of TB, we have some of the highest rates of diabetes uh, in, in any place in, in the country. And so part of the challenge is, and this highlights it, that we've got to do everything we can to improve health care availability in some of the most rural parts of South Dakota, and that's where these reservations are located. So, yeah, they've got a real challenge in their hands, and we continue to do uh, uh, multi-visits with our, our Native American leadership uh, on a monthly basis, or even more often than that, talking about what we can do to assist them and making sure that they do get the supplies. But anytime you have a government-run health care system like IHS, and it's not really true health care, but it's the closest thing they've got. Uh, they don't have access to the best and finest medical needs and or medical assistance, and it shows up when you have a pandemic like this. Senator, how is this affecting the economy of South Dakota right now? And in particular, I'm mindful of the fact that there's still proposals for some more fiscal stimulus. How does the effect on the economy of South Dakota read against that possibility of more stimulus? Well, first of all, in South Dakota, we're, we're ag-oriented. And a lot of the ag activities, they're seasonal in nature, which means when it comes time in the spring, this, when, the pandemic, when the pandemic was hitting, a lot of our farmers, ranchers, and so forth were outside where literally they were already socially distancing to begin with. But they needed to get seed, they needed to get petroleum, they needed to get chemicals, fertilizers, and so forth delivered. So those other businesses were very active during that time frame. Throughout the summer and the fall, when harvest of our wheat and our corn, our soybeans and so forth was going on, those same farmers and ranchers were socially distant. But the producers or the people that were servicing them in many cases had to take the extra precautions. Our economy is moving in the right direction, but our hospitality got hit real hard in a number of our communities. Um, you trying to socially distance, you know, we've got the same problems everybody else does. And once again, a lot of our businesses tried to be very responsible, ask people when they did come in to socially distance and to wear masks whenever possible. We did it on a voluntary basis. 
Right now, we're continuing to try to send a united message to people in South Dakota that it's okay to wear a mask. If you're going to go into a grocery store, wear a mask. If you're going to be uh, involved with a lot of people, wear a mask. Try to limit the sizes of those, uh, of those community activities that you're involved with and so forth. It's common sense. We're trying to get that done so that mandatory or, uh, uh, items that may very well come in at the national level are not being imposed on places like South Dakota. So let's get ahead of the curve, let's bend that curve, and we can do it, we've done it before. And, and we're getting very, very close to the point where we're going to have the vaccines available with not only Moderna, but with Pfizer both closing in on 95% effective rates and having warp speed moving right. those both of those forward in a very rapid fashion. We're convinced that we'll see close to 300 million doses available to the general public before the end of January. Senator, let's turn, if we could, from South Dakota to Washington, where most Americans think there's going to be a transition happening. Certainly, it's a distinct possibility at this point. Uh, are you concerned about some of the actions that the Trump administration is taking, perhaps on the way out the door? And let me pick, pick one in specific, because you're on the Armed Services Committee. They announced that they're going to be withdrawing tr troops from Afghanistan and Iraq. I, I, most of us, I think, on the Armed Services Committee, and me personally, I believe that uh, the removal of troops has got to be based upon what's actually going on on the battlefield. If the battlefield commanders say that they can safely remove those troops, then it's fine. But if, they, if they're not getting that information in, then I'm really concerned about it. I want to make sure that our troops are safe. And sometimes when you, when you pick a number and try to move to it, unless you have assurances that the battlefield commanders can handle it, you could put other people in harm's way. I know that's not what the president wants to do, but most certainly that's something that we have to ask and be reaffirmed that we're not putting our troops in more uh, of a harm's way by having a limited number available. So let's make sure that the decisions are being made in consultation with those battlefield commanders. Uh, the president of the United States, of course, has particular authority when it comes to deployment of troops around the world in foreign policy. What about appointments back here at home? Because now there are signals that President Trump wants to appoint the acting controller of the currency uh, to actually become the, the permanent controller of the currency with a five-year term. Is that appropriate given where we are right now? The, the president always has the ability to make the recommendation, but if it requires uh, Senate advice uh, and consent, that then becomes our role to make a decision as well. We'll look at it and consider that as a possibility. Uh, and, and, and once again, this is a case of where the Constitution lays out who is responsible until the end of their term. President Trump is responsible until the end of his term to follow through when there are those vacancies. So it is up to him as to whether or not he wants to make the nomination. Uh, if it is one which has to be approved by the United States Senate, advice and consent, that becomes then something that our leadership will look at in consultation with the rest of the members and find out whether or not we agree or not. Which actually takes us to the nomination of Judy Shelton for, for the Federal Reserve. That's sort of been withdrawn now, is voted down, but it could come back again. Do you expect that to come back? It'll depend on whether or not we can get the votes. Look, we, we had the votes yesterday early in the morning, but then unfortunately when several of our members came down uh, that were either in quarantine or actually in the case of Senator Grassley who missed his first vote in the United States Senate since 1993 under doctor's orders. Uh, that meant that we were down by two votes and on a real tight vote like that we didn't have any votes to spare. In fact, I think they were expecting that Vice President uh, Pence was probably going to be the tiebreaker on that one. I personally supported her nomination. I think she would have been uh, good on the board, but uh, nonetheless you've got to have the votes if you want to get it done. And, when you do have people missing, it makes it more difficult to get the job done, particularly when it happens on very short notice, which is what happened in this particular case. Indeed. Thank you, Senator. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for your time. That's Senator Mike Rounds. He's Republican of South Dakota. We have some breaking news now. Shares of DISH Network are falling. The FCC is reportedly saying that DISH got improper discounts on Spectrum licenses. That's according to Fox's Charlie Gasparino, who says that the news could have a major effect on DISH's 5G ambitions. Coming up here, we're going to talk about the next four years of the Biden administration and the national security priorities it will need to address with Jack Riley of the Rand Corporation. This is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The Biden administration will take office facing an array of national security issues around the world. As part of our Next Four Years series, we're taking a look at what we can expect. And we welcome now Jack Riley, RAND National Security Research Division Vice President and Director of the RAND National Defense Research Institute. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Riley. So uh, you, just, just play the game. Uh, you're going into the Oval Office with a new President Biden, and he says, what should I be looking at? What do you tell him? Uh, my top three would be China, Russia, and reinvigorating relationships with key allies. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk about China and Russia in more depth, but let me start with allies. It's pretty clear from recent statements that the president-elect intends to reinvigorate or maybe even expand relationships with countries like the U.K., Germany, EU, and other NATO countries. But we also have an opportunity at this point to uh, engage some countries that have been more at the periphery but have concerns about uh, China and Russia as well. India is an example. Uh, yesterday they participated in a large Navy exercise uh, with the U.S., Japan, and Australia, and it's an indication of an opportunity to draw in uh, another important actor on the world stage. How open do you think the doors will be? I mean, on the one hand, there might be there's a pent-up demand for our allies or would-be allies to say, please come work with us again. On the other hand, they may feel perhaps a little bit burned because President Trump often went out of his way to say, I don't believe in some of the, these alliances. I think the door is going to be wide open. Uh, and the reason is China and Russia have propelled themselves to the top of the security list, not only in the U.S., but in, but in many other parts of the globe. They really present difficult challenges that are sometimes referred to as gray zone challenges or hybrid warfare challenges that are provocations, but they don't involve the use of force. Um, you can think of them as kind of a, a contact, contactless kind of war. And um, both of them are doing it in very different ways. Um, China attempts to stifle criticism of Chinese dissidents uh, based in the U.S. and other uh, countries. They've expanded their territorial boundaries by building military facilities on man-made or disputed islands that are generally regarded as international territory or parts of other countries. Russia's engaged in very sophisticated efforts to use disinformation to suppress voter turnout and influence voter choices. They use their natural gas resources to try to drive a wedge between Western and Eastern Europe. Um, and these are very important uh, complications in the security realm, not only for the U.S., but for our allies abroad. So I think the door to increased collaboration is going to be wide open. When we think of national, uh, national security issues, we have a tendency to think about what is so-called hard power. Think about sending warships into the South China Sea, for example, to demonstrate to the Chinese that we still have dominion there. Uh, to what extent do you think the Biden administration might take a different approach to the balance between hard power and soft power uh, as, it com as it comes to national security issues? So th that is a terrific question, and I actually think one of the, the other big challenges that is going to be on the Biden administration's plate that to date no no uh, administration has really had to deal with in all of its complexity is what I call the national security implications of supply chain insecurity. Basically, the links between the economy and national security are becoming much more important, and we need to adjust our strategies to address this. Um, you know, China, for example, is well positioned to dominate and manipulate supply chains to its advantage. They control the market for critical inputs to things like lithium, which are important to making batteries. Um, they're a supplier of many of the world's semiconductors and so forth. And so that, that tight integration between uh, the supply chains that the U.S. depends on and Chinese behavior uh, is becoming very important, and you are not going to be able to address those issues with hard power. So 
soft power is going to be required. So it's interesting, as you mentioned that, I must say the pandemic comes to mind, in my mind, for, for example, with PPE and some of the components of pharmaceuticals with China, we're really focused on supply chains in a different way. So my question is, to what extent did the pandemic actually change the national security issues as opposed to just bring them to the fore? Uh, yeah, I think it's it's the latter. Um, and if uh, if I had remembered it in the moment, I would have said pandemic as well as another example of of how the definition and the scope of national security has really broadened. Because let's face it, the pandemic is a national security issue in a number of different dimensions. And you're right that the the medical and uh, other supply chains related to controlling the epidemic uh, or pandemic to some extent do rely on China. So it is it is very much part of the equation here. Going all the way back to the Obama administration, they famously said there was going to be a pivot toward China, which was interpreted by a lot of people actually as having to do with geopolitics and military. I think it might have been more than that. But would you advise a Biden administration to continue that pivot? I think the, the pivot is... Uh, less about a um, specific country or region and more about the behaviors and the issues that are undermining uh, our national security. So, for example, when China um, expands its territorial claims, it makes it harder to live up to our commitments to allies to provide protection or uh, it endangers uh, commerce lanes and other kinds of things. When Russia interferes in uh, elections, uh, you know, we're, we don't necessarily have the, the confidence uh, that the choices that people are making are, uh, are well-made or not influenced by a foreign actor. So um, I think it's, it's critical that uh, we think of policy and, and broaden our um, security definition to include those kinds of behaviors and perhaps less of a, uh, a focus or a, a intended focus on a specific region or country. Many thanks. Really great to have you with us today. That is Jack Riley. He is RAND National Security Research Division Vice President. We have some breaking news now involving Google Parent Alphabet. The company has just unveiled an expansion of its Google Pay. It will allow users to open checking accounts with various banks, including Citi. The move is Google's deepest venture yet into the U.S. financial system. Coming up here, we go back to the Bloomberg New Economy Forum and hear from Ursula von der Leyen. She is European Commission President. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen spoke earlier today. It was as part of the Bloomberg New Economy Forum, and she addressed the big issue right now for the world, that intersection among the pandemic, the vaccine, and the global economy. Here are some of the highlights from that speech. This crisis has shown us that global public health is the foundation of the world's prosperity and security. Safe vaccines must be available for all, whoever they are, wherever they are, whatever they can afford. No middle or low income country should be left behind. A global recovery is the only way to reopen our economies, to restart the labor market, to repair supply chains and start rebuilding. This is about capitalizing on existing market forces, not fighting them. We need to use our recovery stimulus to invest in the clean and digital technologies of the future. This is the thinking behind Europe's 1.8 trillion euro recovery package. You can count on Europe to lead the way. That was European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen speaking at the New Economy Forum, 
for all the things on the form you want to check out NEF Go on the terminal. There's an awful lot of important people who are saying an awful lot of important things. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to speak with ba we're going to be back with Congressman Patrick McHenry. We spoke with him in the first hour as well. This time, we're going to talk about the prospects for a divided Congress to get anything done. We're going to have a new Congress come January 3. And we'll also be talking to Carly Fiorina, former head of Hewlett Packard, about the dangers posed for supply chains by the pandemic in the tech industry. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio.